people know Dave Duncan is a very well-known beekeeper in our area and very important in keeping us on our toes about our pollinators. You may also know he has a business as a certified pest control and a beekeeper is a man who cares about his pollinators. So he's going to tell us how to control pests without and in keeping our, our pollinators happy. Thank you for joining us, Dave. Thank you, Jean. And I want to thank you for putting this together and all you've done for me. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, that trap. I mean, I'm here to talk about pollinator protection. Part of uh, pollinator protection is is uh, trying to work, get to where you want to be without using pesticides, more target-oriented situations, so that the things that we do to control the problems that we have around our house, whether it's a mosquito, whether it's a unwanted pest of some type, how to deal with that. And that, that trap that I, I just gave that lady, that if you put a banana in that, that's a fruit fly trap. If you put meat in it, it's a fly trap. If you put uh, Mountain Dew in the fall in it, it's a yellow jacket trap. So it's, it's kind of a custom uh, type of trap that uh, you can get at the hardware store. Um, we we'll talk about honeybees, bumblebees, uh, halictids, butterflies, moths, uh, mason bees, leaf cutters. Those are all things that we really need around our house. When you look up at a apple tree that's blooming in the spring, and you know it, it may be blooming next week, I don't know. But uh, when you look up, there's going to be a cloud of things around it, a cloud of small insects, large insects, a variety of things, not just honeybees, and. The more you damage those, the more, even though those might not be counted in a official insect count like they're an important insect, they really are important because the more habitat that we get rid of, the more fence rows that we take out, the more uh, spraying that we do just haphazardly uh, destroys all those, all those bees. Bumblebees, bumblebees are very important. I was explaining to somebody earlier, whoever, I don't know who's growing blueberries, was it you talking about blueberries? A bumblebee will pollinate a flower that a honeybee won't because they have a longer tongue and they can get down into a blueberry. And so as a blueberry grower, you want to have bumblebees. You want to have something like that because they'll, they are custom made for that flower. Honeybee is a good substitute, but it's actually not designed to pollinate a blueberry just because of the design of the flower. They can't get in there. Um, one of the main things, and I, I, I am a pest controller, it's been a very interesting uh, doing pest control, killing bugs, and then being a beekeeper trying to save bugs. And so it's been a very interesting journey in my life, doing one or the other, and trying not to be too big a hypocrite, and, uh, but yet leaving as small an impact as I can on the environment, so that I'm not I'm not killing my friends off, that I'm not killing these these insects off. And I, I was at a, a program at the University of Kentucky, and uh, Bear, they had a guy from Bear come down and explain all these radical people. You guys are some of them, I'm afraid. I'm sorry to tell you that, but uh, these uh, people that. Uh, don't, uh, that are making something out of nothing. They're people that are jumping up and down when there's a large bee kill, when they're applying pesticides uh, haphazardly again and, and killing off all these pollinators. And that's what makes the news when, you know, you go out in the parking lot and there's a layer of dead bees on the parking lot. And then the news guy comes in and the cell phones come out and everything goes on. Um, I went up to him afterwards, because he, he works for Bear, obviously, and um, I said, why couldn't you just tell the people not to spray blooming plants? Why couldn't you tell them that? That was one thing that he just would not come up with. And I, he just was, you know, trying to make something that people are getting excited about killing pollinators, and that, uh, that it wasn't really a real problem. It was just these activists as, and people that, uh, people like me actually, I think. And so, uh, but he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, you know, I said all you had to do is tell these pest controllers, there's 500 of them in the room, not to spray anything blooming. Don't spray any plants 
that have blooming plants underneath them. And this is very important. If you're spraying an apple tree, just because it's done blooming doesn't mean that there isn't clover underneath it, that there isn't uh, dandelions underneath it. And I, I am a dandelion lover. I'm, there's a dandelion festival I used to go to. I don't go to it anymore, but it's, it's available out there for you folks. And, um, but, uh, so that was, that was something that he, he just wanted to create. He, he would not, uh, he would not come to see my side of that situation. And I, I really didn't try to convince him. Again, he works for Bayer. You know, I'm sure he makes a lot more money than I even think about making. So, um, you don't want to spray around blooming plants when it's windy. Uh, if you're spraying your house or you're, if you do have to use pesticides, uh, that wind is going to carry it over to your neighbors, to your lawn, to anything like that. Any type of blooming plants that carry over. We had uh, a plane flying by our house last year. And my partner Ellen went outside and she said, I smell pesticides in the air. Later on we went out that day and there was a pile of dead carpenter bees, which most people are horrified by carpenter bees. They drill a little nine millimeter bullet hole size in your in your house or your log cabin and they seem to be quite a pest but they're a great pollinator but there was a, a dozen of them laying there and that was from a plane that was flying over miles we didn't even see the plane we we just uh it was we but we could smell she smelled the pesticides but it was it, it literally was powerful enough to knock out those carpenter bees which Again, most anybody that lives in a log cabin would be happy to have dead carpenter bees. If I ever felt guilty about killing a pollinator, <coughs> the carpenter bees is probably the one that, you know, someday I'll have to answer for the carpenter bees that I've killed. They're beautiful, they're a beautiful pollinator, but if you own a log cabin or a wood-sided house, they will, they will drill it full of holes. If you can live with that, they will pollinate your flowers. So the difference between a, a carpenter bee and a bumblebee is if you look at their abdomen, they're very shiny, very high gloss, shiny black. And that's from squeezing in and out of those holes that they go into. And the bumblebee will be completely covered in fur. So if you're out there, uh, both of them are friendly as long as you're, uh, the carpenter bees I've never been stung by, but the bumblebees, as long as they're just working and on your flowers, they're not ever gonna bother you. Just don't mess with their nest. Um, <clears throat> so you can mow the blossoms off, um, clovers, dandelions, things like that. Um, you also, if you're going to use pesticides, you wanna know how long are those pesticides gonna last. Uh, what's the holdover period? If I spray my squash with a pesticide, when that, even though some of those squash flowers will close up, you still may be toxifying. Uh, when those flowers open up, you still may, there, there may be some bee damage because of the holdover of these pesticides. Again, I'm not advocating pesticides in any food product. I, I would not, I personally would not spray any pesticides on my garden, but there are people that do want to go to war with the bugs, and I'm just telling you how to use them safely. Uh, follow the label. You know, the label on, the, on there, if it says to use gloves and a mask, you better use gloves and a mask. If you're using, um, because it's a natural pesticide, does not mean that it's totally harmless to humans. It, you know. Uh, Nicotine is a natural pesticide. It's not, it's obviously very harmful to humans. So just be aware of it. I see a lot of people when I'm driving down the road out spraying their yards with weed killer and things in sandals and shorts, no gloves. It scares me when I see that. I just, I think that's something that's not gonna pay off in the end. It's better to have weeds than to be using that without any protection. Um, and I see professionals actually doing it too, but not, not in sandals, but in shorts and things like that. Uh, talking about mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, and mosquitoes are in the news right now because of the Zika virus, but um, they are going to cause some problems. The West Nile was here um, 
when you see somebody fogging in their backyard for mosquitoes, if there's the West Nile mosquito is like 20 feet up in the tree where the birds are. It's actually a bird uh, oriented problem. So most of the fogging takes place 20 feet and below. So if you really want to kill the West Nile mosquito, that has got to be up high in the trees. Most fogging that I see done professionally or amateurs never gets that high. So you're really literally wasting your time. I have people call me for my business that want me to fog their yards. They want me to, and I don't do any fogging. I don't do any mosquito fogging. And there's a reason why, because fogging kills everything. It literally comes over like a blanket and every beneficial insect, every praying mantis, every butterfly, every moth is going to be killed by fogging. Some people would, don't care about that, but that's something that I explain that to them. They probably call somebody else. They don't care, they don't want the mosquitoes at their birthday party. Go on with it. So that's just my, more my problem probably than theirs. But fogging, they, the testing that I've seen on fogging, they had as much results with just plain water as they did with pesticides on chasing mosquitoes out of somebody's backyard. Where they would spray the bushes with water and that actually repelled the mosquitoes. So, and they had um, reports that they gave to the homeowners. They were doing testing on all these mosquito fogging machines and a variety of materials that they were using. And it, it, was, it was kind of humorous because again, they had a high percentage of success with just fogging with water, where it just annoyed the mosquitoes so they went to the neighbors. So, not that I would spray, go to somebody's house and spray water, but I'm telling you, it's not working. Most of the time when you get fogging, it's because somebody complained about mosquitoes in their backyard, and uh, they get the fogging done. And it's not, it's, it's very harmful for bees. It's very harmful for bees. And it's very, like I say, for all beneficial insects, it just, it will literally wipe them out. And I'm not trying to put anybody that's fogging out of business. Just, I'm just telling you, it's, there's there's a lot of controversy about it. And um, so, um, but the, again, the Zika virus is coming in. I'm not sure how much trouble we're going to have in Ohio about that. Time will tell. We've got, you know, but but it it sounds like it's coming. Um, Honeybees are responsible for one third of all the food we consume as far as the pollination of that. So the honeybees do the lion's share of pollination in orchards and commercial crops, but the wild pollinators, and I have a poster of a lot of the wild pollinators over there, and the leaf cutter bees and the mason bees, and just a helictid, which is a very tiny little bee, and um, they do a huge amount. But again, nobody really counts the the work that they do. There's no financial numbers on these wild pollinators. So you don't want to just go wiping them out just because you don't know what they do. If you see them flying in and out of a flower, they're probably doing, they're doing some pollination that, that other bugs can't necessarily do. Um, you want to encourage any organisms that feed it or parasitizes any of your unwanted pests. So if you have larvae in the garden, uh, like your big tomato worm, you get some uh, parasites that you, uh, some wasps and things like that that you could let loose there, or encourage them hand picking a lot of these things, um, and uh, also again back to just high pressure water can get rid of a lot of low level uh, pest problems, so that you're not uh, you're not applying pesticides, you're just spraying water and knocking them off. A few bugs on your plants aren't going to damage your plants. You know, there's a certain amount of tolerance. Now, when you see the tomato hornworm, that monster, thank you very much, that monster, one day you look at your tomato plant and it's lush, and the next day it's a skeleton, it's, it's hard not to grab him and, you know, stomp him. And, uh, but there's not so many of them that you can't literally manually pick those off. I would never spray tomato plants. 
Um, and also the birds. The birds, whether you're putting up bird houses or any insect eating birds, that is something that will encourage eating those larvae. Eating, you know, the birds eat a massive amount of larvae. I heard a naturalist talking at the one park that I went to, and he said the, the trees would literally be defoliated if we didn't have insect eating birds out there going, picking off all the larvae and eating those things. They would literally be just sticks. So encourage those birds, don't discourage them, and um, know what your pest is. Um, Again, you want to educate yourself on what the specific pest is. Um, most of my most of my work right now in the pest control business is uh, dealing with one specific insect. And if it's not that insect, it's really not that important. So I, de I deal with uh, mostly bed bugs. So when I get called in to identify a bug, if it's not a bed bug, I really don't care what it is. It's not that important. So. That's the identification situation is, is something you don't need to know the scientific name, uh, but know whether how bad it is, what the numbers are in your garden, monitoring it, and um, keeping an eye on it. Um, that that really has uh, has a lot to do with it. Also, these papers I have some papers on my table, and it is a it's a list of pheromone lures and traps, and there's probably two or three dozen in this, and the, the catalog's called Gemplers. I just got it in the mail the other day, and I made some copies, I didn't make probably enough, but um, but it has a variety of pheromone movers and sexual attractants and things like that that will gather these and monitor these insects in your orchards, in your gardens, and a variety of places like that. And then they'll tell you whether you need to break out the big guns if you feel like you need to spray or whether you need to go with something organic or something natural. Um, but uh, there's uh, the, the pheromone lure traps are very effective. Now, again, as we've all probably experienced uh, Japanese beetle lures where you, know, you don't know whether you buy them for you or whether you buy them for your neighbor, I'm, I can't tell you you know, I think the lure traps work very well. The pheromones, you know, insects are very pheromone-oriented creatures. So I haven't experimented with a lot of them. I've started an orchard here recently, and I'm going to find out. But I don't know whether I want to buy my neighbor's pheromone lures for their trees or whether I want to put them in my trees to find out. Time will tell here. But some of them use color attractants. Some of them use pheromone attractants, sticky, sticky traps. Sticky, sticky lures on different colored things, and that that will bring them in and attract them. So, uh, and then the other, there's another one that I want to talk about is diatomaceous earth, which a lot of people use for a variety of different things. I see people using it in their house. I see people using it in their garden. I use it on my chickens uh, as an exterior. Uh, parasite, it will kill exterior parasites on chickens and internal parasites on chickens. Uh, but diatomaceous earth is the bodies of diatoms, pure silica, and it's it's a fairly effective, I've used it in a sifter on my garden, on my beans, and sift it on there. It's water soluble, so it will wash off and you need to replace it, but it's very natural. I don't, I don't, I don't fear diatomaceous earth. Although I do go into a lot of houses now that uh, people are using diatomaceous earth to use inside their house for insect control, and that's not good because it's a, dust, a very fine dust, and it's and people are breathing it. But I mean, I've been into houses where they dumped 20-pound bag out. It looks like Mick Jagger was hanging out in there. It's just, it's just powder everywhere, green, whole light up, and you can see it floating in the air. That's time to run, get out of that place, or put a mask on. But people are using that, people are saying that that's the, you know, that's the new thing to kill bugs with. Outside it is, inside, don't use it. it in, do not use any powdered insecticides inside your house. We're gonna be breathing. Um, systemic insecticides. 
Um, that's something you need to be very careful of. The, uh, the big culprit right now is um, midacloprid, which is a neonicotinoid, which is like the devil creation situation there. And it works very good as a pesticide, but if you use it on your plants, it will go into the roots, up into the stalk, into the nectaries of the flower, and it will kill insects for a very long time. They're treating corn seed with it for a while. It would actually kill a butterfly that landed on it when the corn several months later is this tall, and a butterfly landed on that and drank the dew off of that plant, it would kill that butterfly months later. So that's something to keep in mind. It would also toxify the pollen of corn or soybeans or any of that. So it's, it's, a, it's a ticking time bomb. So beware of any systemic in insecticides. They, they can uh, definitely last a very, very long time. For some things, they're great, but for other things, they're just, they're just horrible, and, and it's, it's something that you can unleash on your area and not really know about it. But they're, again, they were treating seeds with it. So is there, is there any questions? Yes. On the carpenter bee? Carpenter bee. Yeah, if they're such good pollinators, how can I keep them away from my house? I got every spring they come back. Um, vinyl siding. <laughs> vinyl. She I've wants got, to keep okay, carpenter I've, bees away from her house. I've got vinyl siding. It's the, it's the I see. Uh, they get in, they'll go up in behind in places where there's raw wood, and they are very ingenious uh, as far as hiding. But I don't know. They, they have developed now some very good traps to trap carpenter bees. And they have a little hole where they fly in and a little glass jar. Again, I don't know what karma's going to do to you for killing a nice pollinator like that, but I'll well, find I'm out. Taking to all out but, the street and left with Well, I understand, <laughs> but yeah, I don't have any. But uh, yes, what other question? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. He had sprayed Roundup, and he had taken a flu shot that day. Just so you know, those two don't mix. Yeah. The government won't tell you that. But there is a place in Nashville, you had to send a blood sample, and they can tell you right away that what it did was it created moisture in his lungs, and then it hardened, and he died from pulmonary fibrosis. I see. Well, flu shots themselves are very controversial. And, and one thing I can tell you, do not take any medical advice from a, a beekeeper. <laughs> That's all I can tell you there. That's a fact. Yes. The mason bees, and, and they're, a, they're a very popular bee, they're a very friendly bee, and pretty much considered, uh, you know, stingless or whatever. Yes, yeah, and that's a very good pollinator, the mason bees that he's asking about. And they've, they've become very popular, and um, I, I can only encourage you to do that. But they're very friendly, they're not gonna sting the neighbors. Yes. Uh, I, I don't deal with ant hills outside, and, and ant hills outside, the big mounds, are typically accused of being a carpenter ant hill. And, and most of the time, and they're a large black ant like that. Or like a fire ant. Yeah. Well, we don't have fire ants in Ohio. I mean, today. We might have them by fall. Somebody may bring some up, but, excuse me. The large, the large ant hills outside are like a field ant, and they're not necessarily a bad ant to have. What you don't want is a black ant in your kitchen or a black ant in your bathroom. That means you probably, a large black ant, that is probably a carpenter ant. But those field ants typically stay outside. The carpenter ants are eating wood in an old stump, in an old tree, and then have their uh, main nest outside in a tree or a stump where you won't necessarily see it. And then they'll have a satellite nest that's living in your house. And that's when you call somebody like me or something like that to get rid of that. That's eating moist wood in your house somewhere. You have a moisture problem. Yes? How big would those ants be? Like uh, probably half inch long or something. You'll, there's a small ant, there's a variety of small ants. Typically a pavement ant is the small ants. 
and there's almost a microscopic ant called a pharaoh ant, and then there's the large black ant, which is typically, if you see it in your house, it is a carpenter ant. And then you need to look at, is that a half inch? Yeah, but a, a large black ant should be, you, you need to be looking for a moisture problem in your house because that's what they're attracted to. Could be a leaky roof, could be a spot in your attic, could be wind blowing rain in a window when you least suspect it, so. Build a nest in the ground. Like the last two years, we moved low. They're right. Just bombarding us. Yeah. There's there's a variety of there's a variety of uh, insects that nest in the ground, stinging insects and bees, and um, they're from very large cicada killers, which are really phenomenal to see. I love to see those things. And um, then there's different types of bees that live in mud and go down and make a mud little like a mud hut. And I've seen huge colonies of those at people's houses, but without having the bee in your hand, you'd have a hard time. Yeah, well, most of them are pretty friendly. And, and most, of them are, most of them are solitary bees that live in amongst each other in a sandy soil. So they're solitary where only one lives in a hole, but yet they will live in colonies together. So you, it's not like a honeybee colony that'll have 80,000. It'll have one single bee, but because the soil is just right and because all its relatives are there, it seems to like that type of thing. But I've seen some phenomenal colonies of bees living in the ground. It's been bad the last two years. We didn't have it the Sandy first Sandy soil? No, it's a lot of clay. A lot of clay? And, I don't know. Uh, we didn't even know they were there in like the last two years. Yeah. And it's different places all the time. But you mow over and then you get changed by about 10 of them. I see. <laughs> I don't know. I run. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering about those yellow ladybugs. The Asian lady beetles? Yeah. Uh, vacuum, vacuum those things. That's, that's those and marmorated stink bugs, both. I would use the vacuum because if you start spraying inside, you're going to contaminate your environment where you're living so it's bad to be spraying sprays in your house and the problem is you're not going to control them inside your house if i could tell you to spray something in your house that would stop them but tomorrow there's going to be that many more come out of the walls that are hibernating in those walls same way with the marmorated stink bug and it's going to be here in huge numbers here soon coming to a house Thank you a million, Dave, for being such a great steward of our community. Thank you for your time tonight. And